Warning, today's episode contains singing. Parental discretion is advised. As long as we got hey, each other. Ready to go, man? What? Ready to start? Uh, can you give me a minute? I, I'm not really feeling it. Uh, well, listen, I, I got good news for you. What is it? They've renewed Dollhouse for a second season already. Uh, no, actually, they've already canceled it. But, hey, we got a donation. Really? Wow, that is good news. Yeah, it looks like you're off the hook. You know what, man? You're not so bad. I'm I'm sorry I've been giving you such a hard time. Don't worry about it, friend. So, should we start the show now? Yeah. For once, it'll be with a smile on my face. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Willkommen, mein Herr. Yeah. Uh, Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 1, number 3, page 39. Nice. I am Rish Outfield. And I am Big Anglovich. Today's story is Lonely Heart Club by Michael Stone. That's right. Michael Stone was born in 1966 in what is widely acknowledged as the fairest city of all England, Stoke-on-Trent. He still lives there with his wife and daughter and has no intention of ever leaving. Why would he when it is so fair? I, I don't know. He's been published all over the place, including the Dune Steve, way back on page 62 of Volume 1, the summer issue. But more recently in the Beast Within anthology and DreadTales.com, the latter for the fourth time, which is a record for that magazine. Not that Mike is one to brag about such achievements. Oh, and his collection of novellas, Foretold, is just out in paperback after a successful run in hardback. His website is at www.myleftei.net and he has a live journal, username My Left Eye. His journal is widely acknowledged as the fairest on all the web. Lonely Heart Club by Michael Stone. This is a story about how I found faith, faith as opposed to belief. And like many stories, it begins with boy meets girl. With her auburn hair and smooth pale skin, her rosebud lips and deep expressive eyes, Catherine Hewson could have sat for Titian's La Bella, or perhaps his Venus with a mirror. She reminds me of Jennifer Aniston before she got too skinny. She is what my father, Leonard Strombolt Sr., calls a dolly bird. He also refers to the music charts as the hit parade, and his jeans as action slacks. Dad is a model train enthusiast. But I digress. Catherine is a nurse at St. Chad's, and I your humble porter. We often see each other in passing. She all trim and neat in her crisp white uniform with her long hair tied back, sensible shoes clicking on the polished floors, me hauling trains of dirty laundry, or wheeling some old geezer outside for a surreptitious smoke. Aye, you know how it is. You're lonely and a pretty girl smiles at you. You begin to compare the smile she gives other guys with the smile she graces you. Did the raised eyebrows and half-smiles she gave to Dr. Murray, the ENT specialist, Rate more than the nodding smile to the security man who carefully watched her reverse her little Fiat Uno in every morning? And how did the good morning and accompanying beam she flashed at me compare to the admonishing smirk she invariably posed to Dr. Captiville, St. Chad's dental surgeon? I made the mistake of asking Clob. You want to get into this bird's knickers? I drew a sharp breath. There's more to it than that. Why do you have to be so base? That's what I am. Clob shifted his weight on the pepper pot and fixed me with a lopsided grin. We were having this discussion in the staff canteen. It's a very small canteen, just sixteen chairs at four tables. And, I continued, I know for a fact that she doesn't put it about. She is a nice girl, decent and respectable. All right. You mean frigid. I can see why she appeals to you then. 
All your hang-ups about sex? His small eyes glinted with pure malice. Virgin. Little bastard. I can't remember precisely how old I was when Club first put in an appearance, but it would be when I was about 14 or 15. To begin with, he wasn't a pig, but a blue fish with a goggle mask and a tank of water on his back. I remember telling Mum about him. I see. She said slowly. And what does he say exactly, this club? Which was also the first question Dad, the family doctor, and finally the child psychiatrist asked me. The latter, a Dr. Wilson, was a splendid black guy with a warrior build and a beautiful mellifluous voice. He's the only person I've ever met who actually had leather elbow patches on his tweed sports jacket. I looked into his noble high cheekbone face and began the usual question dodging. He indulged me for a while, before turning to my mother, who was sitting beside me in this green wool coat she always wore for important occasions like Sunday worship and hospital appointments, and asked if she would leave just the two of us together. I felt nervous myself, sure, but Mum, She looked panic-stricken. It was in that moment I realized something that I, with my childish self-centeredness, had somehow failed to see before. Mum was weighed down with worry. No, more than worried. She was afraid. So we can have a nice friendly chat, Mrs. Strombolt. Man to man, so to speak. She mouthed the word silently. Man to man? She frowned. He's just a boy. Then, capitulating in the face of authority, she shuffled out. It made me terribly sad. When the door clicked behind her, Dr. Wilson moved his chair from behind the desk, so he was sitting directly in front of me, our knees almost touching. Right then, Leonard. Now that Mum is out of the room, perhaps you can tell me what this is all about. He smiled a friendly smile, the effect being slightly marred by the overhead lights reflecting on his small round glasses. Clob, I said helplessly. Clob, indeed. You said a moment ago that you can see him right now. I nodded. And what's he telling you? I want to know. I won't be angry, I promise. I cleared my throat. <coughs> he... he says... Go on. He's wondering if you've got a big... what's it? A big doodah. A hole yawned in front of me. I rushed to fill it with chatter. Only he says he's heard that your sort, black men, you know, have big... He laid a gentle hand on my knee. Okay. That's okay. He tipped his head back and addressed the ceiling. It's perfectly natural for young men to compare themselves, especially when things are beginning to develop. If a young man was to come to me concerned about the size of his penis, afraid that somehow he didn't measure up, then I would assure him that, although there is wide variation in the size of flaccid penises, most erect penises are of similar size. I didn't mean... I swallowed the rest of the sentence. In my dealings with adults, especially teachers for some reason, a denial had always seemed to be taken as proof of guilt. I sat very, very still. My cheeks were hot enough to fry an egg. That may or may not be of interest to you, he said to the room in general. I didn't move a muscle. He flashed me the winning smile again. Relax, Lenny. Can I call you that? Good. Tell me, have you ever seen anyone else with something like Clob? I shook my head. And has anyone else ever seen Clob? No. I knew where this was going. So he's a figment of my imagination, and that's why I'm here. In our own time, don't let's jump to conclusions. Let me try something else. Have you ever heard of Sigmund Freud, Lenny? A bit uh, before your time before my time come to that, but he had a lot to say about people and the way the mind works. Old Siggy, he believed that the psychic structure... He held up three fingers. ...comprised the superego, the ego, and the id. The superego is your conscience. All those values that you inherit from society and your parents. The id is your basic drives. Your instincts for hunger, desire, revenge, pleasure, etc. And finally we have your ego, in the middle. The part of you which strives to balance out the one against the other. The id versus the superego. I frowned with concentration. 
You mean like I might want to do something that I'll enjoy, but if I know it's wrong, I won't do it? Because of feeling guilty. That would be one example, yes. Well done, Lenny. He removed his glasses and gave them a cursory polish on his jacket lapel before replacing them. I'm wondering, Lenny. I'm wondering if Clob is a manifestation of your id. Suppose that you find many of the things you think about or like to do make you feel guilty. I'm wondering whether the natural prurience of a young man has become a burden of guilt. If so, might you not find it convenient to disassociate yourself from that voice? Food for thought, Lenny. Food for thought. He clapped me on the knee and looked at the heavy gold watch on his wrist. We shall talk about this more next Thursday, young man. Let's call your mum back in, shall we? He stood and replaced his chair behind the desk. What will you be missing in school? Maths, I said. We can make it another time if you want. No thanks, Thursday's fine. Hey, any for your thoughts, Leo? Clob waved a little piggy trotter. Dr. Wesley Wilson never did get rid of Clob. He did warn me that the idea was not to dispel Clob, but to integrate him, make him a part of my natural thought processes. Much to my shame, I lied to him in the end, telling both him and my parents that Clob was no more. I should be so lucky. Two years of therapy, and I've still got this abusive little swine following me around more than ten years on. I hope you're not ignoring me, Leo. I know he's out to rile me when he calls me Leo. I hate the way he flips it off his tongue, putting a spin on the word so it hangs in the air long after it's uttered. Thinking about the fridge? I fumed in silence. The trouble with arguing with a manifestation of your id is that they know every chink in your armour. She is probably old-fashioned, and that makes a refreshing change these days. I was aware as I said it how crass it sounded. He pursed his lips and peered over the lip of my tray. Didn't know you liked tomato soup. Um, I don't. Then why, my lion-hearted Leo, have you got a steaming great bowl of the stuff in front of you? Hmm? I braced myself for further ridicule. I've, um, I've heard Catherine is a vegetarian. Clob sucked his fat cheeks in. Eating that stuff will really impress her, yeah? He made a choking sound and put a trotter to his snout. Now I would have thought you'd prefer a girl that likes the taste of meat, if you get my drift. He licked his lips salaciously. You really are a complete bastard. I know, he said and sniggered. <laughs> he broke off mid-snort and said, Hey, the ice maiden cometh. I swallowed hard. If my careful planning came off, Catherine would sit next to me. I knew she didn't like the company of Jason Connolly a nurse himself, and his two friends who frequented the next table, and that the tables behind me were already full. I tried to look cool. Hello, it's Leonard, isn't it? Do you mind if I... Not at all, I said, grinning. Clob shot me a warning glance, and I relaxed the face muscle slightly. Well, I said as she sat down to my left. Well, well. Clob slapped his forehead and groaned. <laughs> I went to spoon some soup up to my mouth. It ran through the tines of the fork I'd picked up by mistake. Catherine looked away. As I dabbed my shirt front with a paper napkin, I glanced at her plate and saw what looked suspiciously like a ham salad. So much for that line of seduction, Leo. I subvocalized something extremely rude. Hey, come on, Leonard. Clob smiled ruefully. Let's work at this together. I'm sorry I rubbed you up the wrong way. He looked repentant, or as repentant as a little red pig with wraparound shades, horns, and a pointed tail can. She is quite something, isn't she? I risked a glance at Catherine. She was daintily folding a lettuce leaf up into a compact parcel. She caught me looking at her as she popped it in her mouth, her storm-grey eyes twinkling as though she could hear my thoughts. Her complexion was like silk. She certainly is, Clob, I said silently. She certainly is. A machine gun laugh came from the next table. Stage whispering, lewd gestures, and more guffawing followed it. One of the male nurses was candidly bragging to the others about his bedroom exploits by the look of things. I saw Catherine's eyes flash in annoyance. I caught her eye and tried to make it clear with a shake of the head. 
that I too shared her disgust. Glob said mildly, If you had any balls, Leonard, you'd tell those louts that there was a young lady present. I kept my head down and cursed inwardly, knowing that what Glob said was true. But I hate to cause a scene, and I knew that the three lads would easily put me in my place if I dared caution them. I can come up with all manner of witty repartee and smouldering put-downs, but only long after the event. Anyway, I'd procrastinated too long. The moment had passed. Maybe next time. I sipped on a spoonful of soup and wished Clob would give me some useful advice. Hey, doing my best. Someone scraped back a chair at the table. Is there anyone sitting here? Does it look like there's anyone sitting there, you garlic crunching pillock? said Clob, a.k.a. Mr. Tact. Um, no, I said, looking up into the tanned features of Dr. Xavier Capdeville. He gave me an easy smile and sat down. I saw with dismay that he had a ham salad like Catherine. It seemed terribly important. We've had it now, Leonard. Clob tipped his head at Catherine. I think she's got something on with the frog. I followed his gesture, and I must confess... I didn't like what I saw. The handsome Capdeville was clearly garnering all her attention. I took a sip of my soup. It tasted bitter. There was raucous laughter from the next table again. (laughs) Jason Connolly made a ring with a thumb and forefinger and collapsed into a fit of giggles. I didn't catch what was said, but Catherine was crunching a radish with unnecessary vigour. Dr. Capdeville took in the scene instantly and, carefully putting down his knife and fork, rose from his seat. For a brief moment it looked like Catherine would object, but Xavier had raised a placatory hand. I am in charge here, it said. He calmly went to the next table and placed the masterful hand on the shoulder of the nearest nurse. He spoke quietly in his ear, motioned to Catherine, then gently patted the shoulder again. He straightened and returned to his seat. One of the lads, looking supremely embarrassed, gave Catherine an apologetic grin before turning away. You could have heard a pin drop. Catherine's smile was enigmatic. Thank you, Dr. Capterville. Oh, please, it's Xavier. You've got to hand it to the frog, Leonard. That was slick. Xavier spoke in his heavily accented English. The problem with English men is that they have no romance in their soul. Clob jumped up and paced across the table. You aren't going to let the French git get away with that, are you, Leonard? Come on, stick up for yourself. Xavier carried on as though he hadn't heard, because of course he hadn't. Love is reduced by them, he motioned to the next table, to jokes about the meat and two vegetables, the cream horns, the wedding tackle. There is no tenderness. In France, love is an art. I should have taken Xavier to task over his stereotyping of English manhood, but instead I busied myself with my soup, pretending I hadn't heard. Catherine, on the other hand, was more than happy to volunteer me. I don't think Leonard's like that. I've never heard him talking crude, and I bet he knows how to treat a woman. Flowers and chocolate and stuff like that. Leonard? Mm, Yes, well, I began. Thankfully, Xavier was quicker off the mark. I was 19 and dating my first English girlfriend. My family had just moved here. She was named Maria. She had this beautiful raven black hair. I used to tell her I could see the stars reflected in it. Tell him that if he doesn't stop waving his fork around, he'll have someone's eye out. She was coming up to her 18th birthday, Xavier continued. A magical time in life, and I wanted to get her something special. She should be so lucky. When I was 18, Mum, belatedly acting on Dr. Wilson's advice to get me out socialising and interacting with others, enrolled me in the local youth club. Dad suggested his model railway club. Run by the local vicar... This youth club consisted of a ping-pong table and a crappy little pool table with no bounce in the cushions. Fat lot of use that was. Few girls, and all the lads as screwed up and repressive as me. I went to satisfy my mum's conscience for two months before I made any number of excuses to get out of it. At least I came away with a good forehand smash. My search for a suitable present for Maria began in the local library. I looked up the foreign language dictionaries. I remembered something about the word Maria from my Latin studies. I found it. Maria in Latin was a plural of mare. This was no help. I knew that my girlfriend loved horses, but there was no way my finances could stretch that far. The back 
A Latin mare won't be a female horse like it is in English. Clob stumped across the table and farted in Xavier's salad. <laughs> Mon Dieu! I slapped my head. What was I thinking? Mare will not have the same meaning in Latin as it does in English. Oh, he's quick, this one. No harm. I looked it up quickly, and there it was, the answer to my prayers. I began to look through other sections of the library. I now knew what I would buy my beautiful Maria. It would be perfect. Can you guess? Bog off. We're not interested, said Clob. Xavier told us anyway. And this is how it went. Xavier helped Maria over the stile. I wish you'd told me we're going bloody hiking, Zave. These shoes will be ruined. Only a little feather now, my dove. And it's pitch dark. Where's your torch? My dad's going to kill me if he finds out. Hush, we don't need a torch. A full moon bathed the hills in pools of cool limpid blues. Evening dew was forming on spiderwebs, leaving strings of glistening pearls draped over the heather. It was ideal. He put an arm around Maria's waist and shivered with anticipation. They followed the sandy path that wound its way up the hillside through gorse and bracken until it began to level out at the crest. When am I going to get my surprise, Zave? Xavier looked at the ground around them and then up into the clear, starry sky. Here will do. Here? Oh, OK, if you say so. This had better be worth it. If you've dragged me all the way up here for... For something else. Xavier looked at her, standing there in her white stockings, pencil skirt and padded bomber jacket. She smiled and her cheeks dimpled. He raised a hand. Come sit here beside me, Maria. I want to show you something. Maria lowered herself and patted her skirt, tugging at the hem. He guided her hands in the dark. Here, Maria felt at something long and slim placed in her palms. It had the feeling of leatherette and made a hollow rattling sound when she took it. It's still in its case. The zip is at the top end. What the heck is it, Zave? She asked, genuinely curious now. Her earlier nervousness was evaporating. The end cap came away and something cold and metal slid out. Light glinted on a glass lens. A telescope? Lovely. Thanks. That's just what I've always wanted. This will come in useful. Xavier laughed. <laughs> that isn't your present, Maria. You can keep it. It is for you, but it is not your present. Maria looked at him, puzzled now. All she would see in the darkness were his even white teeth, and they weren't giving anything away. I don't follow. Lad back. I want to show you something. Lying side by side, he pointed at the moon. Use your telescope on that. You may have to turn the ring near the eyepiece to find focus. Maria extended the telescope and gave a small gasp <gasps> as the yellow lunar disk leapt into clearer definition. Wow, I can see everything. He laughed. <laughs> that is the idea. Are you looking at the grey plains? He snuggled closer so that his lips were near her ear. They are called Maria. Maria? But why? I mean, what does it mean? Early astronomers thought the Laval Plains were water, and so named them as seas, or Maria in Latin. It's the plural of Marais. Many have these beautiful romantic names. Do you see the large one on the left? That is Marais Tranquillitatis, or the Sea of Tranquility. Slightly above is the Sea of Serenity, and below it is the Sea of Nectar. There are also seas of clouds, showers, moisture, vapours. He had to stop there, because Maria had covered his mouth with her own. He kissed her back deeply and slowly before gently pulling away. All Maria are quite wonderful and unique in their own way, he said softly. As are you. He looked into eyes shiny with reflected moonlight. Catherine's eyes were shining. Oh, Xavier, you gave her the moon. Xavier Capdeville sipped at his coffee and shrugged nonchalantly. It was nothing, he said. His smarmy smile added, for a Frenchman. Ha, huh, big deal. I mean, it isn't like you actually gave her anything, is it? 
apart from a cheesy telescope that probably cost a couple of quid from a junk shop. Clob was trying his best, but I could tell his little heart wasn't in it. I had to hand it to Xavier. There aren't many teenagers who would think of doing something like that. They tend to be more direct. Catherine gazed at the debonair dentist over the rim of a teacup as she sipped at her drink. She put it down with a small frown. I'd have enjoyed this more if I'd remembered to put sugar in it. I'll go and get you some, I volunteered, half out of my seat. It's all right, Leonard, she said, placing a hand over mine. I'm going to get myself a pudding while I'm there. <laughs> she giggled conspiratorially as she rose and left the table. My hand felt warm as though indelibly imprinted by the slight pressure of her fingers. I looked at Xavier, who acknowledged me with a raised eyebrow. Our glances bounced off each other like marbles. I stared down at my soiled shirt, adjusting the lie of my tie so that it covered most of the soup stains. So much for the tomato soup gambit, I thought miserably. Had you really expected that to work? It took me a second to realize it was Clob's voice berating me. No, I subvocalized. I looked across to where he was sitting on the edge of the table, his chubby legs swinging to and fro. Suddenly he stood up, staring. And when Clob stares, it's quite an event. His eyes shoot out, restrained only by coiled springs that pull them back inside his head with an almighty twang. Too many wasted Saturday mornings watching cartoons, I suppose. What's up? What are you looking at? I followed his eyeballs, but I could see nothing remarkable. Clob waved a fat trotter. That? He looked at me, his eyebrows oscillating wildly two inches above his head. You can't see it? What? I was starting to feel unnerved. Clob had never behaved like this before. He had never seen anything or told me anything that I, at some level, didn't already know about. This new development did not bode well. It's... it's his id! You mean lover boy here? His actual id? Clob nodded, still staring at an empty patch of formica. I had to ask. So, what's it look like? It's a camel wearing a silver foil fez! A camel wearing... That, surprisingly, didn't seem too weird. I've always associated France with camel cigarettes, ever since my Uncle George brought loads of them back from a trip to Calais. They are, I suspect, an American brand. But the association is there, and the cigarettes come in soft foil packets with pyramids in the background. All this seemed to flit through my mind in a split second. I felt quite pleased at my analysis and subsequent denial. You are seeing no such thing, Clob. What do you mean? I ain't seeing no such thing. Ah, we're playing that game, are we? Ignore me and I'll go away. You never learn, do you, Lenny? You've got to trust your instincts sometimes. Dr. Wilson told you that. Look, I know you don't believe in me. I'm just some kind of projection, right? But once, just once, it'd be nice if you put some faith in me. Catherine was settling herself down. She had chosen a strawberry cheesecake. Ooh, I love strawberry cheesecake, I told her. I could faintly hear Clob protesting in the background. Hmm. She said. Oh, yes, it's nice, isn't it? So, Xavier, you and Maria, did you go out with each other for long? I beg your pardon, Catherine? Oh, no, only a matter of a few weeks. I let my mind wander at that point. I was torn between wanting to excuse myself from the table where I had become a spare part and staying just to be near Catherine. I chose the latter as it meant doing nothing, something I'm very good at. I watched her from the corner of my eye, her perfect lips parting as she took elegant bites from her dessert with her perfect teeth. Something in her expression made me follow her gaze to Xavier. He looked distracted, the usual easy charm and casual patter missing. How come you parted so soon after her birthday, Xavier? I'd have thought she was very much in love with you after a gift like that. She scowled. Some girls are so ungrateful. The dentist shifted uncomfortably in his seat. No, Catherine, you misunderstand. Uh, it was I that finished with Maria. He hung his head, gazing at the tabletop between his outstretched fingers. He made as if to scratch his head, paused, rubbed his eyes instead, and ended up whirring into thumbnail with his teeth. I glanced at Catherine, who looked at me as if she expected me to say something. I looked at Xavier to find that he too was studying me from under his fringe. I felt like an insect under a magnifying glass. I cast my eyes down to see a very smug-looking clob. What's this? He said. Xavier cleared his throat. 
The point of the exercise, with the telescope in the moon, Catherine. He paused to scratch a sideburn. The point is, uh, I only did it to get into the bird's knickers. A spasm crossed his face, as though he wanted to bite his tongue off and spit it out. He dragged himself to his feet and left the table, giving me a heavy pat on the shoulder as he passed me by. His departure was as abrupt as his sordid admission. I looked down at Clob, stunned. You? He nodded enthusiastically. Good, eh? I had a word with Humpy. Explain the situation with you and Catherine. And he had a word with the boss there. Not a bad sort, considering he's French. Go on, sunshine. The way's clearer now. He tipped me a wink and popped like a soap bubble. My eyes swiveled to take in the delectable nurse at my side. It wrung my heart to see her so. She looked like someone who had emerged unscathed from a road accident, but only by the narrowest of margins. My head was full of candy floss with the implications of Clob and Xavier, or Xavier's id. And I was supposed to come the Casanova with Catherine? My tongue swelled to thrice its normal size and tied itself in a knot for good measure. But I did something incredibly brave. I reached over and covered Catherine's hand with mine. She blinked, and for an awful second I thought she might snatch it away. But she didn't. Way to go, Lenny! Only, now what? Panic began to reassert itself. I had this vision of us sitting there all afternoon, unable to break the impasse. She said, I really thought he was different, you know? I gave the hand a gentle squeeze and turned my reassuring smile up a notch. I know he has something of a reputation, but you'll laugh at me now. I thought he was honorable. I'm sick of bores like Jason Connolly. You go out with somebody like that and they're just after one thing. And after that, you're just a trophy. I thought Dr. Captiville was above that. How wrong can you be? She indicated a plate where a lonely slice of ham was sweating. I ordered this yucky ham salad even though I'm a vegetarian, just to have something in common with him. How sad is that? She gave a brittle laugh and brushed a stray hair off her forehead. Oh, very sad, I agreed, and then told her about the detested tomato soup. I figured it would make her feel better if nothing else. And here's me thinking you like the soup so much you want to take it home with you. She motioned at the stains on my shirt with her dainty chin. So, you only had the soup because you thought I'd be having it. You are sweet. God, we are a pair together, aren't we? Yes, we are. A pair together. The silence stretched. I still had a hand under mine. It was getting hot. She checked the watch pinned to her breast pocket. Oh my goodness! She pulled her hand away and made to leave. I'm going to be in trouble with Matron if I don't get a move on. She paused as if she was about to say something, or waiting for me to say something, changed her mind, stood up, and walked away. It happened so quickly I hadn't screwed up the courage to say my piece. I had been on the verge of asking her out. I had! So close, so bloody close! But now the moment was past, and I knew with horrible certainty that I had blown my one and only chance. No, I would go after her. Go on, Leonard! My traitor legs remained firmly rooted under the table. My backbone was a wet thread of cotton. Oh, who was I kidding? I slumped over the table, feeling more lonely and dejected than I could ever remember. Clob was going to give me an absolute dressing down, and I would deserve every acid-coated barbie flung at me. A voice spoke quietly at my shoulder. My shift ends at five today. Lay off, Clob, you little... I sat up sharply and spun round just in time to see Catherine leaving the canteen. The scent of her perfume was a lingering ghost. She popped her head round the doorframe and gave a small wave. I think I might have waved back. Author's Note Hi, I'm Michael Stone, author of Lonely Heart Club. It was originally published as Clob in the Teddy Bear Cannibal Massacre Anthology, but later wrote a sequel called Japanese Motorcycle Club, so I've retitled this first story to tie in with that one. Anyway, Leonard Strombold. He's going to have an angel and devil perched on his shoulders, complete with a harp and pitchfork, or well, somewhere along the way the angel was dropped off. Maybe a saintly version of Clob would make a good premise for a third story. You'd be forgiven for thinking that by making Clob a pig I was referencing male chauvinism, but actually I took my inspiration from an album cover way back in the early 80s. In the UK at least we had the Now That's What I Call Music series. And volume 3 featured a cartoon pig on the cover, complete with shades and source of demeanour, a model Clob on him. 
Dr. Wilson was modelled on my high school maths teacher. Leonard, I'm sorry to say, shares many of my foibles, the poor lad. Well, hope you enjoyed the story. I'd like to thank the Doomsday for their terrific production, and to say hello to all my friends at Live Journal and the Graveside Tales. See ya! Alright, welcome back! Why am I welcoming these people back all the time when they don't go anywhere? Oh, believe me, they go. You hear that clicking sound? Bye, listener! So, uh, earlier, we forgot to introduce our third host. Third host? Yeah, at the start of the show. I mean, we said, hey, here's Rochelle, here's Big Anglovich, but we didn't say, hey, here's 080T. Ah, well, that's too bad. I guess we can now. Yeah, so here's 080T. How you doing today? Hey, robot. How uh, How's your day been, man? What did he say? He said he's had a great day, hmm. a really enjoyable time until Rish got here. I'm sorry I asked. You know what, I'm just going to ignore him for the rest of the show. Well, that's kind of the way you do it. All right, hope you enjoyed the story. I love Michael Stone's stories myself. I love Michael Stone's wife. Uh, I, I mean to say... He's going to send some blokes to work you over. To give you a good rogering. Um... Hey, thank you, Michael, for sending us another story. He was our... He was the third story that we ever put out. Um, yeah, okay, so he, he sent us this story a long time ago. And, yeah, we're just barely getting it podcast. But he wrote another story in this same series. That's right. And I promise you we will get this story on here a heck of a lot prompter. Is prompter a word? Part of the reason it took so long to get this sucker out was uh, that I I didn't want to torture our poor audience with more of our faux English accents. And so we were trying to get actual English people to do the voices, and maybe we did. But for the most part, it's just me and, and Big doing our thing. And I, I, I hope people aren't put off by that or... I don't know. If, if they're not put off by my Scottish accent, then they're not put off by anything. That, that was Scottish? See, I thought <laughs> that Club was from Cambodia, and, and it made so much sense. All right, so if you have a story that you'd like to submit to the Dune Steve audio fiction magazine, how would they do that, Rish? Well, we've got an email address, which is submissions at dunesteef.com. They could send it to us. Hopefully they'll read the submission guidelines beforehand. Yes. And... Uh, Send us your story in the body of an email, and we will uh, have one of our wonderful, wonderful lackeys read it <laughs> and give us the old Nero thumbs up, thumbs down. And if it passes muster, you could have our terrible accents reading your story. That's right. Yes, the lackeys will read it, and they will say, mm, I like that one. It amuses me. Mm. That's really gross, you know that? <laughs> Also, uh, something that we encourage people to do is leave comments about the story. You know, how, how was that Cambodian accent? I, I really do enjoy it when people comment. It makes me feel, I don't know, about 34% less lonely. Wow. That's just over the tipping point. See, that will guarantee that Japanese motorcycle club gets read as long as I'm still around. So keep those comments going. And you can also uh, swing by our newly established Facebook site or our newly established MySpace page and uh, check that out. Do you have to be a member of Facebook to view our page? Let me rephrase. Uh, I was unable to view our page because I'm not a member of Facebook. Well, become a member. I think people would like to be your friend. God, it would make you feel 34% less lonely, I bet. Hey, also, one time you said that people could write reviews in iTunes. That's right. Uh, you know, I don't know exactly how they do it over on iTunes, but I think the more reviews you get, like the more prominent your thing can be listed as or whatever. So we definitely encourage people to go over there and write a comment about our podcast and perhaps it might rise up in the ranks and people might say, hey, I wonder what this Dune Steve show is that iTunes is telling me about. I'll check it out. That's really cool. I went to iTunes to look us up uh -huh. and somebody had given us like a gold star. You know, like a, a, when a first grader does a really good job, uh -huh. you give him a star. And I mean, it was awesome. It was out of five. 
But still, there was just right there. That's right. I appreciate that, folks. Okay, donation plea time. And I think you're up. Uh, I don't think so. But, but you said we got a donation. You said so right before we started the show. Did I? Yeah, I, I think the microphones were even on. Yeah, about that. Uh, I've got some good news and some bad news. The first... Oh, is it about dolls? Da- and in answer to your question, neither are dollhouse related. Okay. But good news. You sure this time? Yeah. As you may have guessed, the bad news is I lied about us getting a donation at the start of the show. And the good news? The good news is we've got a very special guest in the studio today. Oscar nominee and all-around creepy guy Christopher Walken. Really? I have to do this? A deal is a deal. All right. Folks, this is Rish trying desperately, pathetically even, to sound like Christopher Walken. The reason for this is because we didn't get any friggin' donations. This makes me sad. As far as I was concerned, donations were a given. I, I consider them our birthright. And I'll be damned if we're going to go another week without our birthright. Would it be so hard to push the button? You see the button there? I, I don't understand why you wouldn't push it. You make me unhappy to be here. I don't want to look at you anymore. Oh, okay, wait. I, I take it back. I, I didn't mean it. I like to look at you. In fact, when Rish? I... Rish? Yes. Uh, that's long enough. You're sure, Big? Very sure. In fact, we passed long enough about a minute back. All right. <laughs> Press the button, folks. That was, that was good stuff. Okay. And remember when I told you before that I lied and that we hadn't got any donations? Right. Well, I actually lied about lying. We got a donation just fine, but... I figured everybody deserved to hear your impression, anyways. You know what? You're you're a horrible person. You know that. It's... <laughs> you're a very bad man. Okay. Well, it's too late to do anything about this. But by the time this episode airs, Dollhouse will have premiered. Yeah, I'm so excited about it, and here we are talking about it, and people are going to hear it after they've already seen it. They will. They know way more than we know. Yeah. Interesting. Well, anyways. The Fox show, Joss Whedon's Dollhouse, which I'm so excited about that I... Oh, shoot. I just soiled myself. It's hard not to be excited about Joss Whedon making something new, but it's also hard not to feel dread because you know you're only just going to invest in something and just as another famous Joss Whedon Fox show that didn't last an entire season. So, I don't know. I mean, I'm excited about it because, yes, it's a Joss Whedon show and he hasn't steered me wrong yet. You and I, as we mentioned way back in July, went Uh to the Dollhouse panel at Comic-Con. And, yeah, even before then, I was all excited. It's Joss Whedon's got a new show. And, and yeah, we went there and I got to ask Joss a question. And, well, ever since then, there have been tiny little bits of news trickling out. I mean, Fox certainly isn't promoting the show like they have other shows. I mean, otherwise, we would know all about the show and what everybody's name is and what they look like (laughs) and how much cleavage there's going to be. Well, it seems like there's going to be a lot of cleavage, though. Yeah? Some of the commercials I've seen, they've got a a few of them. Like the The image that they have for the show is like the city over uh, Eliza Dushku's naked body. So it can't be all wrong. I hope not. And, you know, (laughs) it's easy to demonize Fox because they completely fracked Firefly. Whoa, uh, OIDOT? So, so it's easy for me to vilify those guys. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the, the money they make on one episode of American Idol probably outweighs anything that they could have made on Firefly had they renewed that sucker for five seasons. Yeah. And whatever they make on Dollhouse is probably a write off compared to just their piece of sh. All right, OT. <laughs> Reality shows and you know, shows like Cops and that that cost nothing. They cost dick to make. <laughs> oh, Ada, are we going to have an all bleep episode again? Come again, on, man. I, okay, I, 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 down. I on, will let's, limit let's myself down the room here. to one more profanity for the rest of the show, okay. and I'll just save it in my back pocket. But I do hope that they give it a chance, let it get an audience, yeah. let the word of mouth spread, and instead of killing it after half a season. Ugh. Give it a chance. Give it a a season and a half before you consider the death sentence. 
But hey, at least they're showing the first episode, although technically they're showing that one second. Are they really? Are they doing that again? Well, they made Joss shoot a new pilot. Okay. Let's see. All I can ask for is that it gets more episodes than Drive did. Jeez, how many did we see of Drive? Were there four that aired? According to Whedon, they paid for 13 episodes, right? Right. So they paid for these. They've made these. They're in the can. And to cancel a show after like three or four episodes or six or whatever it is and just not show those, they are basically throwing away that money, right? I don't know. I mean, may, maybe by showing a rerun of Prison Break or something, they can make more money than they lost by paying for these episodes or something. I'm not sure why they go about doing things that way. But, I mean, even Firefly, you know, it's got some of my favorite episodes of all. And you look on the back of the box and it says, Original air date. Never, Never aired. aired. Goodness, that just makes me sad. Since we're talking about a TV show, and this is a this is an idea we've had to do for a podcast for a long time, is we wanted to do a retrospective, a look back at our favorite TV show themes of all time. You know, we discussed this off the air. Uh, I was a real lonely child. Don't play the sad music. Too late. It's already playing. Okay. Uh, folks, I was a really lonely child, and I watched so much TV, and... Uh, there would be shows that I didn't like, but I would still watch just t- to pass the time, or the heat of the set. I-, I have no idea, but it's just I watched so much television. Yeah. I confess to you also off air, but now I'm not. Uh, I guess I'll just confess. But yeah, I was even mentioning to you at the same time that when I was a kid, I watched so much TV that I would actually tell time by what was on TV. I'd be like, oh, I'd be like, i got to be somewhere at 6, and ah, growing pains just started. That means it's 5.30. I better get ready. Just sad. And yet, I loved growing pains. (laughs) Dude, I did too. I had a dream about growing pains, and it's just funny because I still treasure that dream all these years later. (laughs) I mean, later I met Kirk Cameron and Alan Thicke, but... I didn't treasure meeting them as much as I treasured that dream about <laughs> <laughs> the dream where you were uh, where I Leo was a Caprio. Caprio. I was Booger. <laughs> no, it was Boner. Sorry. Oh yeah, that's right. Booger was the Revenge of the Nerds. Boner. That's even worse. Holy crap! How did they get away with a freaking name like that? That was supposed to be a family show, and they got a guy named Boner on there, well, and his best friend Woody. Woody was actually on the, another show. No, I, I remember Woody Boner and Erection all being Mike Seaver's friends. That's right. Uh, so we figured we would talk about maybe our five favorite uh, TV show themes. I had a lot of difficulty <laughs> culling down. the it's list hard. down to, to five. So I've got Moonlighting, The Brady Bunch, Mission Impossible, Friends, The Incredible Hulk, <clears throat> and Spider-Man all as my ones that didn't make my list. Oh, yeah, the Spider-Man song. I love to share it, folks. Spider-Man, Spider-Man. It does whatever a spider can. I loved how they would include that somehow into all the Spider-Man movies. We'd be walking along, and there's that lady playing it on the violin. <laughs> Did they do it in the third Spider-Man movie? I don't know. I don't remember that. I'm not as familiar with the third one as the first yeah. two. Let's see, I never hated Spider-Man 3 as much as everybody else did, but I'm afraid that if I were to watch, watch it, it more. yeah, uh, I would hate it and i don't want to hate it especially since if you pay attention folks you can see rish outfield in the background that's right i'm sitting here right now because of spider-man 3 (laughs) nice okay so give me your number five please okay so on my list I, i rearranged it a little because i remembered one that i really liked and i had to bump that up and bump a few others down this one was, it was a toss-up. I was really close to putting the Knight Rider theme song, because that What the heck was that? R.A.O.T. is a big fan of Knight Rider. I guess Kit might have been a distant cousin to R.A.O.T. Weird. Anyways, I almost put Knight Rider theme song down, because that one's just a classic. It's just... You know, you just gotta love that. Right? You just gotta love that song. It's just really cool, but... I went with one that was really similar, and it's a little less well-known, but it's, again, that same kind of style of electronic. So the song that I picked was 
the Airwolf theme song at number five. This theme song was so good when I was a kid. I didn't like the show very much, to tell you the truth. Although that helicopter was really cool. It would, like, put out those heat bursts to get the missiles and all that freaking cool stuff. It was one of those shows that was on later than, like, my bedtime. Mm. But I would try and sneak in just so that I could hear the theme song of the show play before I went to bed because I loved the song so much. I never watched an episode of Airwolf. (laughs) Or maybe I did, but I would be playing with toys or something Uh at the time. I can sort of remember it. How, How did it go? It's and then we go It was just good. I remember it now, yeah. I really like those kind of big triumphant sounding kind of songs too. Oh dude, I I bet you Mike Post or whoever it was, same guy wrote both themes. That's probably true. I wouldn't be surprised. You know, it's surprising just how rich and impressive the tradition of tv show theme songs are i mean seriously we could probably sit here and sing more than a hundred songs that everybody listening would know oh let's do that next week (laughs) yeah it's funny uh, just since we've been talking i thought of another one that should have been on my list (laughs) and it didn't make it yeah this is probably fodder for a couple of episodes Okay, so before we mentioned Firefly, so I got to mention that the theme to Firefly. Okay, before I had ever seen an episode of Firefly, there was a, a comic book convention and they had the entire cast that was there in LA to shoot this movie called Serenity. They were all there and it was just this packed house and there was nothing else going on. So I, I happened to go to it and. Oh, people were just going nuts. And I've talked about this before, that it was a completely alien phenomenon to me because I vaguely knew about the show, but I knew enough to say that, hey, that show was a complete bomb. Anyhow, at the end of the the panel or the presentation or whatever, where they were talking about this movie they were making, somebody somewhere got the idea of let's sing the theme to (laughs) Firefly. And so all around me, These people started singing, take my love, take my land, take me where I cannot stand. And I was looking around and just like, what the hell? Oh, there it was. (laughs) Oh, there's your word. And I didn't get what was going on. But, you know, it's like, I don't care. I'm still free. You can't take this guy from. It was like a a backwoods revival kind of thing (laughs) where people were standing up and shouting and singing and crying. And they were so happy that that their friends were up on the stage. I I wish that I had been like keeping a journal at the time and I could have recorded just how unnerved I was by this uh-huh. showing of emotion and loyalty and all some kind of it was like a religious fanaticism for this show. Mm-hmm. Oh, it, I'm sure that that was the high point of, of well, at least their week of mm-hmm. every single person that was there. Probably and, you know, some months, of them were maybe the high point of their life, you know. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. That's yeah. how emotional this was to these people who had loved the show that, you know, had been cast aside. And out of some kind of divine intervention, they got a one more episode. Yeah. They got a movie, you know, kind of thing. That closure, yeah. as the psychologists like to preach about. Just a couple of years later, you and I went to Comic-Con and we went to one of those brown coat meetings where uh-huh. it's like fans of firefly your coats of a brownish color it was on sale <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the the that show of that meeting reunion screening panel whatever you want to call more it. words please i'm gonna kill you this is gonna be a long episode isn't it it already is they played the theme and everybody was singing it, and it was like the national anthem or a drinking song or whatever and everybody was singing and at this time though you and i knew the song yeah <laughs> and it's like, i don't care i'm still free you can't take the sky from me and it was amazing how in just two short years i had had this change of heart you were converted I was converted, and I felt a bond with the people in there. And at the time, I wasn't as big a Firefly fan as I later became. I mean, like now. But uh, there, there you go, Firefly. Uh, it's not really fair because I have so much emotional attachment to it. But it's on. It's on the should list. be number one, not five. So another theme song. Uh, I figured I couldn't leave this out. It's a Transformers theme song. Um, I remember when I was a kid, I already watched the cartoon all the time and would transform and sing along and all that crap. And then the movie came out. And they Did had Lion that, do the theme song? <laughs> that was their name, Lion, which is not White Lion or White Snake or White Zombie or Great White, 
but just Lion and Nobody Band. But they were like this heavy, freaking hard rock band. And they did Transformers! And then the freaking guitars went crazy. And that just made it even cooler. But yeah, it was just a good theme song. You know, I considered the, the stuff that I loved when I was a kid. You know, I liked Voltron. I liked Transformers. I liked G.I. Joe. But Transformers was definitely the best of, of those theme songs. You know, like G.I. Joe's Fight for Freedom Wherever There's Trouble. G.I. Joe is there. Def- definitely not as cool. And apparently Carol Channing sang that theme too. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. Who knew? Well, do you remember those commercials for the toys for the Transformers where – They'd say, you know, Transformers. And then some kid with like an effed up robot face would go, Robots in disguise. Yeah, his eyes would glow or something oh like that. gosh. And the horns grew out of his skull. I think. And then it said, kill your parents. <laughs> <laughs> okay, at least it said that to me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I just love that theme song. I don't know if you feel the same, but. I do. I do. Well, you like the Transformers and that's gay. Oh, you got me. Okay, well, speaking of uh, stuff that, that is embarrassing, I got one. My next one's oh, going to no. blow yours oh, away. Oh, I know what it is. I think go. Oh, it's not what you think because oh, okay. I wouldn't dare to put that, although I could sing <laughs> the whole damn thing. In fact, if we get a donation, I will sing the theme to Jam in the next episode. Oh, d- nobody. Dude, seriously, you're sinking our chances of getting donations with stuff like this. Oh, so I should say if we don't get a donation. Yes, if we don't get a donation, you'll sing the theme to Jam. Are you going to sing the Misfits part, too? We are the Misfits. Our songs are better. We are the Misfits. We're going to get it. Wait, wait, wait. You're blowing it. (laughs) You blew it. Okay, so this next one, I've got written here, cheesier than Gorgonzola. Okay, I like a a lot of those themes from the 80s, like family Uh sitcoms. Okay, Like Family Ties, like Growing Uh Pains, like Give Me a Break. Wait till you see my number one. But I like this one the best. Here we are, face to face, <laughs> a couple of silver spoons, oh. hoping to find we're two of a kind. <laughs> come on, come on. You got to say Taking one more Taking it line. all, making it all together, together. we're, we're going to find, find a way. Oh, wait, O.T., can you edit that out, man? No, leave it in, because <laughs> it's crazy. The things that you find cool when you're a kid suddenly become lame one day. Well, for me at least. It's like a, it wasn't just like a sort of falling out with that. It was just all of a sudden, you know what? I hate that. But then you give Rick it... Rick a... Schroeder, Ricky Schroeder, I mean, just became like the synonymous with lame. And yeah, you know, who would have guessed that we would still know who Jason Bateman is today, but that Rick Schroeder would have gone away? Because Jason Bateman's star set way before Ricky Schroeder's did. Yeah. And then now he's back, and he was in Hancock and uh, Arrested Development. And so, yeah, he's back. But then all of a sudden, the nostalgia thing suddenly hits. And a lot of that stuff, Jim included, from when I was a kid, suddenly is cool again. I remember the advent of the internet when suddenly you could hear these themes and stuff that you hadn't heard since you were a kid. And I was just like, oh, my gosh, Silver Spoons! You and I. I was just watching Robot Chicken the other day, and one, you know, this is total throwaway little one second piece that they put in there, but they have the little static channel switch, and then there's two spoons sitting there across from each other, and the one says, Well, here we are, face to face. And they change the channel again, and it's just like. Dude, that is an obscure joke, man. <laughs> it's just, uh, the nostalgia factor, really something to it. Okay, please save us from the lameness of me just going on and on about silver spoons okay moving on to other lameness i wasn't a big fan of the artist who penned this song and i think they originally had him singing it in like some of the early seasons and then they later cheesed it up with like a tv theme song singer one of my no idea where you're going (laughs) one of my favorite tv theme songs of all is the theme to bosom buddies which was a song by billy joel do you know this song you don't know Bosom Buddies? I don't Buddies? care anymore. There you go. This is my life. That was the theme to Bosom Buddies? Yeah. Oh, Bosom dun, Buddies dun, with Peter yeah. Scolari and the other and, guy. The other and, the guy, that, I can't remember his name. Tom something. Sizemore? No, Selix Thompson Twins. It's one of those great songs that you'd hear it on the radio. And I, when I was a kid, songs like that would come on the radio. And I, and I would jump up onto our fireplace and have had like a... What do you call that when the fireplace is like raised up? An erection. In front of the fireplace, there was a slightly raised 
bit of brick that then the fireplace is on top of. I don't know what you would call that. I'm sure I don't know. <laughs> so that song would come up on the radio and I would grab, sadly we didn't have tennis rackets, so I had to have to grab a ping pong paddle and pretend that I was playing guitar. And we'd get up there and we'd sing that. I don't care what you say anymore. This is my life. Dun, 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 dun. It's a good song. Now you said you don't like Billy Joel? I'm not really a Billy Joel fan, no. And, but that's that's interesting. Yeah. You know, I, when I was trying to compile my list, I thought about well, how many times does somebody just grab a song that was a hit 20 years ago or is, you know, on the radio? Uh, well, think of like Dawson's Creek. I don't want to wait for our lives to be over. I did not watch Dawson's Creek. That's all right. You will. <laughs> well, we'll dedicate this episode to Wendy Joe Sperber. Is that okay? Okay, so so uh, like Dawson's Creek, they, that song was already a hit before yeah. Dawson's Creek ever started. And so I wondered about songs, you know. There's Happy Days, 12 O'Clock Rock or whatever that was. I mean, that Rock Around was, the Clock. but Rock Around the Clock was like 20 years old. By but the then they came up started. with a legitimate True, theme but, song that's way more, not way more famous than Rock Around the Clock, but in its day was way more famous. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so much more identified with Happy Days than Rock Around the Clock is. Is that on your list? Happy and free. <laughs> oh, happy days. All right, so what you got, man? Okay, so usually my criteria for a, 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 a great theme song includes, you know, memorable or singable lyrics. Uh-huh. But this one, along with Mission Impossible, is just so great that I have to list it, even though there are no lyrics. And it's the theme to the Twilight Zone. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? In retrospect, maybe it shouldn't be on the list because it's just <laughs> that. But gosh, I love the Twilight <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Dude, that's so memorable, though. I mean, people use that theme song. They use that in movies and stuff when like weird things happen. Then some character goes... Nee, 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 nee. And they don't have to explain what it yeah, is. Yeah, they know, you know exactly what they're saying. Hey, this is freaky. I don't really even have anything to say about it, so we'll go on to the next one. But the one I thought of while we were talking was uh, Beverly Hillbillies. I, I sort of wish I had put that on my list. Okay, go That's ahead. a good one. I didn't include some that were real classics that could easily, like we mentioned Adam's Family right before we started recording. Everybody and their dog knows that. And my, that is a talented My kids dog. actually learned somebody changed the words around and they used this song in like preschool to teach them the days of the week. They're like, days of the week. So it's one of those things that... Well, hey, at least they didn't learn it from MC Hammer. Okay. All right. But yeah, then there's like the Brady Bunch, and there's, I don't know, there's tons of others that have... Flintstones, Jetsons. Just great lyrics, songs that everybody knows. Uh, okay, so moving on, um, this is one that came to me at the last minute. And I mentioned a little earlier, I think, that I really like really big... Men. No, Sorry. I didn't mention that earlier. Thanks for bringing that up. That's what she said. <clears throat> Sorry, I should stop laughing. I just happened to see your number one. Okay. I really enjoy theme songs that are really big and bombastic. And I collect a lot of movie soundtracks and stuff like that. And that's kind of what are the criteria. I mean, I have songs that I really enjoy, like the Star Wars theme song or Indiana Jones theme song or Superman theme song or something like that, where they're all really big type songs. And so I think this may be like the most triumphant theme song for a TV show that there is out there. And that's the Battlestar Galactica theme to the original Battlestar Galactica series. You know, I think in the new one, they now use it as like the national anthem for for the Caprica or the 12 colonies or whatever the heck it is. That was so cool when they played that. But it's just such a triumphant song. It's just like, it's got the drums going at the start. And it's just so powerful. And that's one of the things I think is really lacking in the theme song in the new show. It's just... Oh, it's not even that memorable. It's just terrible. I mean, it's bleak and crappy and sad, which is kind of what the show is like. (laughs) So it more reflects its series than the old theme song did. But, you know, that song is good enough to be on the Star Wars soundtrack or something like that. It's just really impressive and well done. Just as bombastic is my number two. Yeah? Okay, I can't really sell that. Sherwood Schwartz, the theme to Gilligan's Island. (laughs) 
Everybody just, just sit right back and you hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip, fateful trip that started on this ship. Sorry. Oh, that's all right. I screwed the whole thing up. Oh. Just <laughs> sit right back and you hear. Oh, sorry. Uh, you our lost poor it. listeners are going to hate us for it. Well, you can edit out the earlier ones. Let's just go with Gilligan, the skipper, too. The millionaire and, and his wife, right. the movie star, the professor and, and the rest. <laughs> what is this? And the rest crap. Mary Ann, here on Gilligan's Isle. Oh gosh, we've lost so many listeners. <laughs> I know the end theme too. Remember how Beverly Hillbillies and Gilligan's Island both had an end theme as well. Now this is a tale of our castaways, they're here for a long, long time. They'll have to make the best of things, it's an uphill climb. You don't know it? The first mate and his skipper too will do their very best to make the others comfortable in the tropic island nest. No phones, no lights, no motor cars, not a single luxury. Like Robinson Crusoe, it's primitive as can be. So join us here each week, my friends, you're sure to have a smile. With seven stranded castaways here on Gilligan's Isle. Uh, I just sang the whole theme to Gilligan's Island. We may be well beyond saving at this point. What number are we on? So you're ready to go to the number one of all time. I got to hear what you're thinking on this. You're not ready, huh? I don't know what it is about this song and why I love it so much. Um, it's reminiscent to me of the Cheers theme song, which I think is also oh, one, Cheers of, the, is good. Yeah. one of the oh. best theme songs of all time. But I didn't include it on my list because I wasn't as much of a fan of Cheers the show itself because I was a kid and I didn't get it all that well. You know what I mean? If I'd watched it when I was a little older, I might like Cheers a lot more. But, but I love that song, the theme song. I thought, wow, they could just put that on the radio and everybody would listen to it and love it. And I thought the same thing about this theme song. And most people have probably forgotten it, but it's the theme to Punky Brewster. Oh, folks. I, I, can you edit that out? What is your real theme? <laughs> That's right. I absolutely adore the theme to Punky Brewster. It was just such a great song. Now, you've played it for me before, and uh-huh. it sucks because it comes flooding back, and suddenly I'm a little kid again. <laughs> and yeah, oh, I loved Punky Brewster. Uh-huh. Not that way. How does that go? I could sing it as well as you can sing Gilligan's Island. (laughs) I think our listeners would like to hear that. I don't think they would. But uh, I'll give them the uh, chorus of it just to to save us some time because I'm not going to subject them to that. But the chorus is the part where it goes, Every time I turn around, I see the girl who turns my world around. Standing there. Every time I turn around. Her spirit's lifting me right off the ground. What's gonna be? Guess we'll just wait and see. Da 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 da. And then, what's the name of that dog on the show? Brandon. Brandon goes rough. Da da da. He may only do that in the cartoon or something. I don't know. <laughs> do you remember Glomer? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Shoot, dude, we both watched the Punky Brewster cartoon. <laughs> I didn't watch it a see, lot, I, but Glomer I, is one of those things that you can't forget. It's just so bad. See, I understand why no woman will touch me, <laughs> but the fact that you've got a loving wife and about eight kids running around, it's one of those things. It's like, wow. And you felt no qualms about putting that as number one on your list? I just had to be honest, man. Okay. <laughs> I have no follow-up to that. Good. And I don't feel nearly as embarrassed. And you knew what mine was going to be because yes, I, I go on and on, on and on about this theme. It's funny. Right before I moved away from L.A., that, there was a karaoke competition that I got in. I won a T-shirt. Uh, and then there was a TV show theme competition. And I was like, oh, I am there, man. And I got in line. I filled out all the forms and that. And there were like 20 of us, and we had to get up on a stage with a microphone in front of all these people and sing our theme with no backing or any of that stuff. So I got on there, and a bunch of other guys got on there, and and this guy, like two people before me, did the theme to South Park. And he went as far as to do all the characters' voices, you know, with Cartman saying, Mm. friendly faces everywhere, humble folks without temptation, and Kenny going, and it was dead on. This Kenny neighbor. That's right. Mm-hmm. This guy sounded exactly like those characters, and he was really impressive. And uh, then it was my turn, and I did the theme, my favorite theme song of all time, to The Greatest American Hero. <laughs> 
So I got up there and it's like, look what has happened to me. I can't believe it myself. Suddenly I'm up on top of the world. It should have been somebody else. <laughs> believe it or not, I'm walking on air. I never thought I could feel so free. And all these people that had, couldn't even have been freaking born when that show was on were like clapping and, and, and enjoying it. And so, you know, I'm rocking out on the microphone and flying away on a wing and a prayer. Who could it be? And I did the second verse that they didn't even do on the show. Well, they never do the second verse on a show. A theme song's <laughs> got to be like a minute or less. I know. And then I think I did the chorus twice. I don't know. Or I think I said, everybody sing, believe it or not, them. And there were like two or three people that were actually old enough, and they were singing along. Anyhow, uh, it was it was really good, way better than my Christopher Walken impression. And <laughs> afterward, you'll be damned if you didn't win that contest. Go oh, okay. You. So the end of the contest came, and they had the third place, and I can't remember what he sang. Who cares? Didn't whatever. It like the Will Smith show. I th- yeah. Okay. So I, I think you're right. I think the third. It's weird that you know the story better than I do. So they had the audience vote and all, and 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 all this. And but I just knew that this kid, the South Park guy, was going to win because South Park is a much more famous <laughs> show, much more contemporary show, much more successful show. I did a good job. And recent. And and he was really good. And I thought, yeah, okay, I would give it to this guy. You got audience participation, but you sucked, and that guy did a good job, right? <laughs> well, you would have thought I sucked, but. Uh, yeah, they announced the winner, and it was me. And I beat out South Park Guy. I was number one at this TV show theme. And you got a T-shirt for that, or what'd you get? Got my pick of all this really cool stuff, and there was this hardback Star Wars poster book that showed like all of the international posters through all the campaigns and and stuff. It was so cool, and it was one I had seen in like Barnes and Noble. But who could afford to pay yeah, sixty it costs bucks like for a book? Seventy, hundred dollars to get it. But uh, that was so cool. And afterward. The South Park guy came up to me and, yeah, I told him, hey, dude, you know, you probably should have won. That was really good. And the guy had the cojones to ask me for the book. It's like, if you thought I should have won, why don't you give me the book? It's like, wow, dude. What a piece of crap. (laughs) Well, anyhow, we've been talking for a long darn time and I pity the fool that has to edit this podcast. But uh, I I also wanted to talk about bad TV show themes, but... uh, Maybe we should do that next time. Yeah, we, we could talk about how low the ratings were for Dollhouse and then do our low theme songs. Please, folks, watch <laughs> Dollhouse. I promise to never sing the theme to Greatest American Hero again. Not just on the show, but never again in my life if you guys will watch Dollhouse. So thank you for listening. That's right. This has been Big Anklevich. And Rish Outfield proclaiming, You can fly. You belong in the sky. You and I could belong to each other. Uh, oh, wait, OT, uh, could you, you edit, edit that out, now. please? Good night. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Take two. And today's story is Lonely Heart's Club by Michael Stone. I don't think it may actually just be Lonely Heart Club. Well, I have changed the title. Because you are the master now. Yeah, that's right. Only a master of evil doth. Mm -mm. Paul Lynn does Obi-Wan Kenobi. The Force can have a strong influence on the weak-minded. Yeah, Lonely Heart Club. The Force is what gives a Jedi his power.